screen. All right, let's get started. Uh, let me introduce you to Luigi for those of you who don't know him. Uh, as I said, Luigi is uh, the founder of mlnproduction.com. If you haven't subscribed to his newsletter, then you should, because uh, I think that it's, it's quite unique, uh, the sort of topics that are, ad that are addressed on this newsletter. But also, um, Luigi created a course that I found um, quite unique as well. I think that you released that course in the, in the summer. Was that right? Is that right? Yeah, I released the course about mm, perhaps uh, in the beginning of the summer, in the middle of summer. I, I, I forget now, but uh, it's been out for a couple of months now. Yeah, but what I, what I thought was super nice is that like, there's so many courses about you know, how to uh, build machine learning models, how to experiment with machine learning. And this was sort of... Um, I don't think I, I had seen at that time any courses focused on you know putting machine putting machine learning in production and also showing you hands on how to do that with uh, tools like uh, so you you based this course on Amazon SageMaker for some right. reason I can't see your video anymore but Luigi but you're still around right I'm still here okay the videos back yeah. Um, so there's, I've got some controls here. I can sort of focus the attention on either your screen or mine, but I can't remember how to sort of make it split screen. It's either you or me. Sorry, I'm uh, sort of switching between no problem. the two. But um, I'm trying to understand how to turn it back to how it was before. There you go. OK, there we cool. go. Um, so excellent course, excellent um, newsletter. Uh, you've shared some great posts also on LinkedIn, which uh, I'm, probably going, I'm probably going to refer to uh, during this conversation. And what else? You're a director of data science at 2U. Is that your current uh, title or has it changed? No, yeah. So I'm currently the director of data science at 2U. Thanks for the, the introduction. I know there's a, I'm a bit multifaceted. I do a lot of different things. Uh, <laughs> But yeah, I am actively the direct, that's my full-time job. I'm the director of data science at 2U. And what I do there is uh, manage a team of data scientists um, and work with AI product managers and machine learning engineers. Uh, and really we're responsible for all of the machine learning products that are operated and, and built at 2U. Okay, can you give us a quick example of you know one of these uh, models or the sort of, uh, I don't know, sort of uh, key models that are being used that to you. I, I know I'm sort of, you know, getting straight into it. Sure, Maybe I sure, should sure. a couple of things about myself at some point for those of you who don't know me, but, you know, I'm just curious to get a quick idea of what to you is also for those who uh, might not know it and, you know, the sort of machine learning models that we're talking about just to sort yeah, of absolutely. explain things. So, you know, uh, I won't go into too many details mm -hmm. uh, because a lot of it is proprietary, but cool, let me cool. see what I can yeah. say about it. Uh, so. First of all, just a bit of an introduction on what 2U is. A lot of people aren't familiar with 2U, and it's not very surprising. Uh, that was almost by design from when 2U started as a company in about 2009. So 2U is an educational technology company, um, and it exists in what's called uh, the Online Program Management Space, or OPM for short. And what we do is help universities uh, create online educational programs. So when 2U started, it was really focused on the graduate degree market. So for instance, 2U would partner with uh, leading universities like uh, USC, uh, UNC, Fordham, uh, and, and help them convert their on-campus master's programs into fully online immersive experiences so that students from around the world could register and take uh, online graduate degree programs and once they graduate, uh, receive a regular diploma uh, that is no different than if you were to com be completing the program in an in-person experience. So that's how 2U started. Uh, since then, it's expanded. We have now also offer uh, boot camps uh, in partnership with universities. And we also offer individual courses, otherwise known as uh, short courses with universities. So okay. we're really brand stewards in the sense that we work specifically with universities to uh, bring their programs uh, to market uh, to larger audiences of people online. Okay, got it. Yeah, so, so that's what the company in general does. And it's a very 
uh, dynamic company. There's a lot of services that are being provided, not just uh, technology platforms. But in terms of the data science department and the machine learning, specifically the machine learning focus of, of my team, we really work on optimizing the business, uh, the business, so to speak. So okay. in, in, in previous newsletters, I've written about you know companies where data science is a core competency versus companies where data science is performed to essentially um, improve different operational aspects or build new features. Mm -hmm. And to you is definitely in that latter category where we don't actually offer, you know, we don't build machine learning specific products that we yeah. sell, but we do use machine learning to optimize different areas of the business. And, and one yeah. area, for example, is uh, in natural language processing. So, where, yeah, I guess uh, one, one of the things that you could think about would be, you know, adding recommendations or um, those sorts of things, but it's not necessarily features to, um, for, for the end users. It could be, as you said, to improve operations, right? Right. Yeah. So it could be features uh, for the end user, but that would be, I would say, sort of uh, not what the company was founded on or built upon, but things that it is building towards. Uh, right. So, you know, areas in which we do a lot of work are uh, natural language processing, recommendation. Uh, we do a lot of uh, structural data modeling uh, for teams like marketing and finance um, and, and operations. Um, okay. So it's a pretty it's a pretty dynamic team in the sense that we, we act almost as consultants that help different teams um, across the business. So very functional in the respect that we're focused on data science um, and we work with different teams to understand what their problems are, uh, what data sets exist, and then how we can leverage those data sets to improve the operations or the achieve the goals of those individual teams. Gotcha. Cool. Um, all right, quick, quick um I'm just trying. I'm just trying to make sure that I'm not forgetting anything in terms of uh, you know how to introduce you. But I think that we've we've covered it, right? Uh, there's one other thing that I want to come back to. Are you just telling me? Uh, you were just telling me before when we were in the green room. Uh, but um, so, a quick word about me for those of you who don't know me yet. Uh, my name is Louis Louis Doran, and I don't work in any particular for any particular company, but uh, I work as an independent machine learning consultant. So maybe you know there is a similarity in the fact that you know you need to sort of help different teams uh, figure out you know what they can do with machine learning. Uh, and a lot of what I do is also uh, towards helping frame the uh, the machine learning projects, um, aligning the possibilities of uh, machine learning with what the business might care about, and um, you know setting up an MVP, deploying an MVP, uh, and yeah, sort of helping people. I think that they already saw a question around um, you know getting a checklist or sort of having a roadmap of what of things that you need to do. Uh, so, you know, that sounds like the sort of things that I would do. And uh, more and more, uh, I, I spoke of doing consulting. I think that more and more what I'm what I'm doing is uh, more similar to coaching than consulting. And that's the thing that you were telling me about, Luigi. You also think of yourself as, you know, doing as coaching uh, data scientists, right? Absolutely. Can you yeah, so I, I, um, I mean, it's interesting why I joined 2U in the first place, right? 2U is this, is this educational company and uh, education is really important to me. So I was very, it was a really mission oriented reason for me to join the company. And before I was at 2U, I was actually teaching. Um, I taught a couple of uh, graduate courses in statistics and uh, data engineering. And, you know, I found those to be very like, fulfilling experiences. And, and the reason why I, you know, taught those courses was because I thought that there was really uh, what was missing from the classroom was a really applied, uh, really applied knowledge that people who are working in the field uh, needs to know, right? I did I did degrees in math and computer science, and in the computer science degree specifically, what I found to be the case was, you know, we learned a lot of technical knowledge, but then as soon as I transitioned to the workforce, I had to learn many more technical things that I thought could have easily have been taught in the classroom and just weren't. Mm -hmm. So when I started teaching, it was specifically to impart some of that um, applied knowledge that people who are working either as data analysts or data scientists or data engineers should you know, be equipped with when, they, when they're on the workforce. And what I found to be the case, especially as I've transitioned into management in data science, is that a large part of the job, at least for me, 
tends to be around uh, training the data scientists right. who are on my team. And to do that effectively, uh, this is like really a, a coaching yeah. uh, job, right? So the, the way I compare it to is when I was, when I was you know, the students I most enjoyed teaching were those students who were really hardworking. And um, that happens to be about, let's say, like 5 to 10% of the class, right? And, you know, what I enjoy is that the people who are on my team are also very hardworking. So in a sense, I get to teach uh, my favorite students, uh, the people who really want to be there, the people who really want to put in the hours. Um, and I think, you know, if you're an experienced uh, manager in data science, right, you should have a strong technical competency. And I think that's what I bring to the table because of, of my years spent actually doing the work. And you want to leverage that in order to bring up sort of the average technical competency of the folks on your team, right? Because uh, if, you know, if you're being promoted from an individual contributor to a manager in data science, chances are you are a strong individual contributor. And, and that means that you had a strong technical competency. And one of your responsibilities then is to bring up the technical competency of the team in general. And I think that's one of the highest leverage things you can actually do as a manager, right? Because we can't be relying on your own skills in all of your projects. You need to be relying on the skills of the individuals on the team. Right. Um, the so going back to what you said about you know things that they would they need to know before you know entering the the the, the workforce. Uh, things the so I'm curious if there's like what would be the the top lesson or the top thing to know. Like if you think about yourself maybe uh, X years ago. Uh, sure. And you know what would have been like the thing that you wish you 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 knew at that time, and that would have made the biggest impact on your machine learning projects. Yeah, I think I almost think that I, in some cases, I actually knew it, but I didn't want to believe it. Uh, and <laughs> and it, and it's that you know, the success of a project really does not come down to the complexity of the model that you choose or to the purely sort of technical aspects of the project. Mm -hmm. right the the technical aspects of the project are but one of the like facets uh, of what's needed in order for a project or a product to actually succeed what the most important thing is and this is something i try to stress both in my writing online in my coaching in person and in my newsletters is the like business problem that you're trying to solve yeah right because solving that business problem is actually what's going to lead to value being generated either for consumers or for the business and typically you can get, you know, there's this 80, 20 principle where you can get a lot of the value generated from very little actual like complexity. And I think that's something that we should be as data scientists, we should be hammering over again and again and again. And this is um, not to say that this is not to say that all projects need very sort of uh, non complex solutions. But this is almost to sort of the OCAM's razor, like, you, you want to be as simple as possible and no simpler. Yeah. And I mean, even in the choice of, um, you know, which I know that, you know, some people are trying to figure out what is the right use case they should focus on uh, when they're just starting out with machine learning. And I think that also, you know, in terms of choosing the, the, the right um, sort of pilot projects, uh, choose something simple, right? Uh, choose something that's both simple and that has um, high potential impact. Uh, so you want to consider these two things and then um, and then, right, I think that what you said also reminded me of one of your posts uh, on LinkedIn where you said, uh, essentially, you know, don't sleep on how you define the, 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 the problem, the target variable uh, of your machine learning problem. Um, I'm trying to remember exactly what you said, but I've, I probably have a link somewhere uh, in my notes. But basically, I think you, you, you said that uh, sometimes you can get m improvements by just, you know, changing the definition of that target rather than you know, building more complex models. Right. Can yeah. So I, I can, I can, yeah, I can, I can elaborate on that a bit. Uh, you know, there, there was this interesting paper I read a couple of uh, months ago, and I think it came out of, uh, uh, it was a travel company. I forget the name of the travel company, booking.com maybe, I think it was booking.com. And they laid out these like six lessons they learned from building production ML systems. And one of those lessons was, you know, if you want to make some improvements to your to your overall project, actually reformulate the way uh, you're looking at the problem rather than iterating on the current solution you have. And I think that's true, not just specifically for reformulating the target of an ML problem, you know, going from something like a regression problem to a classification problem or vice versa. Mm -hmm. But I think it's true if you even 
you know, step further back and consider the problem from a product perspective, which is, you know, should, for example, should we frame this as a machine learning problem at all? Yeah. Uh, should our first solution be a heuristics based solution that we can then iterate on? Um, you know, go going back to something you spoke about uh, a few minutes ago, you know, I mentioned, I mentioned that, you know, focusing on the business problem is the thing I would, I would go back and, and say to my younger self, but I, I would say even more, right? Like the impact that we'll have down the line, you know, we want to start looking at it like earlier on in the project life cycle. And that starts with choosing the projects that we're working on, yeah. right? Some, some projects have the ability to have more impact than other projects. So if we were to if we were to just model the impact of a machine learning project, we could say, for example, it's the product of the impact this project might have times the uh, ability to actually, um, you know, capitalize or implement the solution. Yeah. Right. So there may be problems that are very hard to implement and those that are easier to implement. And then there could be those problems that have massive impact or have very little impact. If you're working on a problem that is easy to implement, but has very little potential impact, well, then it doesn't matter how good your machine learning model or solution is because you're not going to actually have large impact. The types of problems that you really want to be working on are those problems that have huge uh, opportunity to actually generate value and have impact. So, you know, the more you can work on those problems, and that's not a technical problem. That's really a, a problem, a problem of, of sort of what challenges do we actually focus on? And, and choosing those problems correctly really relies on having the right business relationships, knowing your stakeholders, knowing what problems they have, and being able to associate the problems they have to the impact that solutions might actually be able to realize. Right. So that is much more of a, a general uh, business stakeholder uh, knowledge problem than it is, you know, how do I train a classifier? Yeah, now, training yeah. a classifier is very important, right? But if we don't get the steps right before it, then training, you know, we're going to spend a lot of time and money because doing machine learning is, is, a, is a challenging thing, but we may not actually realize any ROI at the end because we're just focused on the wrong problems. Right. Um, do you have an example uh, just to make things a little bit more concrete of you know, changing the, the definition of the, the target variable, like right? some of these sort of parameters that you can uh, act on to make it simpler or to any ideas? Yeah, you know, a lot of the examples I have are, are very too specific, so I don't want to, okay. I don't want to like get into those too much. Uh, but you know, let's maybe like let's talk about a couple more things, and I'll, I'll be sure to come back to this question as uh, you know, I'll let I'll let the question simmer in my mind a little bit. Sure. Um, well, I might have. I mean, at the same time, I was asking that question. I was looking through my slides, and I've got. I think that. Um, let me let me share my screen real quick. Sure. Um, well, so actually, I have, I have an example as well. If, if, okay. Um, so, okay, you know, go for it. And then yeah, I'll be so, I mean, so very, very simply, this is something I was thinking about earlier today, and it's not a specific project I was working on, but it's it's something that I, I think could be useful. If you're building, let's say, a lead scoring model, right? You're, you're a company, you're generating new leads, and you want to know sort of the propensity for one of these leads to actually convert, purchase your product. Uh, one of the important segments of these leads is uh, where they're being sourced from. Right, you might be getting some leads from like paid advertising, like on Google or LinkedIn. You might be getting other leads from uh, your blog, uh, SEO. You might be getting other leads directly from organic search on Google. Right, so you know you might be sort of thinking, okay, well, let me just build a model that takes in all of these leads and then spits out some propensity uh, for these leads to convert. And what you might find is your model does much better at predicting uh, leads who come from certain sources versus other sources. Maybe we do good at, at paid marketing, but we're really bad at the organic leads. So the sort of simpler solution would be to implement something that's perhaps rules-based rather than uh, totally machine learning end-to-end -end based, right? And what I mean by that is maybe you can get a good sort of lead scoring model just by doing some naive historical averages for mm -hmm. uh, particular lead segments. Whereas on the other lead segments, you do much better when you have a model. But when you sort of, you know, when your training data set consists of all these leads, um, you, you, you tend not to do very well uh, for certain segments. So what I would say is, well, you know, you should implement some combination of both of these things, right? So rather than your target being predicting the propensity score for all of these leads, we can reformulate the problem and say, 
we're going to have a heuristic based solution for leads that come from these sources. And then we're going to implement a machine learning solution for leads that come from these other sources. So what you're doing yeah. there is, you know, you're simplifying, you're changing the target in the sense of we're only actually generating predictions for a certain segment, uh, because this is the segment that we know, um, you know, is we can do a good job of predicting. Whereas these other segments, we're not doing a very good job of predicting. And we'd rather have a more explainable, simple heuristic based solution, uh, which gets us most of the way there, for instance. So that, that, that's that's perhaps one one type of example. Yeah, yeah, that that, make, that makes sense. That makes total sense. Uh, the the other sort of example I had was you know when you're trying to predict something that's going to happen in the future, uh, just sort of reducing your your prediction horizon. Uh, like you know you're trying to predict. I think that's um, for instance you know credit scoring, or you're trying to predict whether someone is uh, is going to be able to repay their credit in full or not. Um, if you look at, I have like this uh, Kaggle competition in mind where actually you, you're trying to predict whether there's going to be a credit, a payment default of more than 90 days in the coming two years, right? No, you're not trying to sure. predict in the, uh, so you know, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a good thing to, when you're defining your, your target variable uh, to identify all the parameters. So here in that example, you've got the 90 days and the two years. And then you know you can play with those to sort of make the problem simpler. Yep. Um, yeah, and we, we work on a lot, we work on a lot of those types of problems where we need to actually like threshold. We're doing some sort of prediction in the future, but a lot of these events could just happen indefinitely into the future. And in order for us to capture like most of the of the variance and also like have business impact earlier on, we actually just set some threshold x x number of days. Um, and basically treat anybody beyond that number of days as a, you know, yeah. within a class of its own. Right, right. Um, I think that, you know, that's, that's a great way to sort of start the uh, sort of top lessons uh, for, you know, doing machine learning in the, in the real world. Uh, but, you know, maybe let's, if, if we'd be thinking in terms of uh, putting machine learning in production, um, is there anything else that comes to mind in terms of, oh, yeah, I wish I, I would have known that. Uh, two years ago, and you know, it would have made my life so much easier. I would have avoided uh, mistakes. I think that in your um, in your previous newsletter, you you talked about this uh, uh, this issue of you know finding out uh, from monitoring your predictions that there was there was a bug somewhere in the system, and that you know so maybe you know one of the lessons would be uh, implement uh, monitoring like implement certain metrics for monitoring your prediction uh, in advance of deploying the, the whole thing, or maybe it could be something else. Yeah, right, so that, that's certainly one of the lessons. Uh, I mean, there, there, there are really so many. Uh, one, <laughs> you know, I, I, think, I think the thing that is always helpful to go back to if you're just starting out on a project is, you know, you wanna get the simplest thing out the door that you can. It's not gonna be perfect, and, but the goal is to be able to iterate on that solution and to learn more about the problem uh, as you're actually operating in production. So, you know, when, when you're actually building a model, uh, sort of let's, let's say in the lab, you have access to all of this historical data and perhaps you have, a, you know, a large um, um, enough sample of data where you can actually, you know, train a model on, on a large sample and then actually test it on, on another large sample. But at the end of the day, you still don't know how the model will perform when it meets the real world, Yeah. right? So until you actually start generating predictions on live samples of data and analyzing those, you don't know how your model is going to perform, right? Because the distributions may just change so dramatically. The environment may just change so dramatically that you have no way of being able to predict a priori how your model will perform. Right. So one way, one way to get around this, right, is to deploy something, but maybe not act on the predictions that are being generated from shadow the model, deployment, right? right? Right. Yeah. So this has become known as, as as shadow deployment, and you know, sort of in retrospect, it seems like a simple idea, but in practice, it's it's not simple at all. And one of the reasons it's not simple at all is because, first of all, it just takes a lot of money just to get to the point where you can actually deploy something, right? It takes a, a lot of hours of development time, a lot of hours of data science uh, to be able to have a working model. So for most teams, you know, that are being managed against some KPIs. Um, once there's a model, we want to get the thing out the door because we can then say, hey, look, we have a model that's in production, we're, we're generating value. And, you know, it takes, uh, I would say, some, some, you know, courage 
for, for the team and for the management of the team to say, hey, we have something. We're going to put it, you know, we're going to, to, to run it and monitor it. But we're not actually going to use the output because, you know, to, to, the, to, those, to that supervisor's manager, that may just seem like you're wasting time, right? Like you've done all this work and now you want to just test it some more. Uh, but really, that's probably what you should be doing. And what that allows you to do is to gain trust and to gain confidence that the model is actually doing what you want it to do because you can see the, the rubber so meets the road, so to speak, right? The model's in production. We're able to uh, see what the predictions are like. We can monitor distributions of both the inputs and the outputs. We can sort of simulate what would have happened in certain cases uh, if we had relied on those predictions to render decisions. And that's just not possible until you're rendering your predictions in, in real time. Um, sort of a follow-up to that is once you're in shadow mode, if possible, or even if you're already in production, you need to be logging everything, right? You need to be logging all of the inputs. You need to be logging all of the outputs. And the reason for this, software engineers already understand very well, is that you just don't know how your system is going to break. And you need to have the, the appropriate context in order to debug the thing once it does break. And even if it doesn't break, but you just want to sort of understand performance, you need to be able to have that necessary context. That context often comes from, from your log messages. So there's something that here's one area where I think even you know, new software engineers aren't very well trained. Certainly data scientists aren't very well trained is the quality of the logging messages that you're actually outputting in your application, right? This is, this is I would say, more important than anything else. People are very familiar with you know, printing things to standard out when they're developing software or models but really the log lines that the log lines really have most of their value once your your application is in production and you're retrospectively looking at the logs to understand what was happening uh, within the application not when you're actually developing the thing log, logs are read much more frequently once a software tool is in production than when you're developing the tool yeah is there anything in particular you're thinking of in terms of you know when you when you logging uh, your predictions right don't forget to log like this bit of information um yeah uh, most importantly i would say is uh, uh metadata right because a, a lot of your a lot of your prediction your predictions will differ based on uh the entities that are being let's say inferred upon or, or predicted on mm -hmm. so you may have certain yeah. uh sub segments of the data that are very important you know going back to my example from earlier we might we may want to log we may want to look, be able to understand the predictions from a certain lead segment or from a certain geographical area. So the mm -hmm. important mm -hmm. thing to do here is to identify a priori, what are these important uh, subpopulations of your overall uh, population? And then to be able to uh, understand how your application is performing for those subpopulations. So metadata that gives you context on who or what or, 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 you know, or, or when you're generating these predictions is very important. Yeah. Yeah, uh, and following up on the logging, you know, because you do, you don't want to just be parsing your logs to understand context. You do want to spend some time upfront, uh, you know, defining some metrics that will be useful for you to actually monitor in real time for operational purposes. Uh, going back to the example you brought up from an earlier newsletter of mine, we didn't do that, and uh, what happened was we deployed a change, and this change had been live for for some number of months. Uh, but uh, we weren't actually being notified that we had we had broken something, right? Our we were this was a regression problem, and and what wound up happening is that the uh, distribution of the output uh, numerical value that we were predicting changed by several orders of magnitude, um, and it happened quite you know quite rapidly. the The change was deployed. Uh, this sort of shift happened, and we didn't recognize it, right? And uh, this would have been very very easily. Uh, observable had we just been uh, emitting a simple metric, which was just, you know, what's the output prediction that we're generating? Yeah, just the um, sort of plotting the, uh, I, I know that a lot of people want to sort of plot distributions of uh, inputs, uh, of production inputs, but I think that you can also plot the distribution of um, of your predictions and just see, you know, is the, is the, the, the mean value of predictions changing or just the shape of the distribution uh, is there any shift on that? Uh, I think that that can be super useful. Uh, when you when you talked of uh, rubber hitting the road, uh, this is what came to my mind. Uh, can you guys see that? The sort of skateboard approach. Yep. Yeah, it sort of reminded me of um, this sort of analogy. Uh, you, you're trying to build a machine learning system, which uh, the analogy is, is with a car, 
and there's sort of two ways to to go about that um uh, there's the skateboard approach which is that one at the top and then the other approach which uh, is probably not recommended right uh so building like a very simple model and then you know maybe adding uh, a little bit of complexity but at least you know this is something that's the skateboard is something that's usable uh whereas you know on, on the, like the on that bottom line uh, you only get to a usable system like at this last step so uh, I really like this analogy with um, skateboards. Yeah, I, I like I like this analogy too, and the, the sort of the difference between uh, sort of an agile approach at the top and more waterfall approach at the bottom, where we're just delivering the solution all together at the end. And I think that's 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 dangerous in software, and I think it's even it's way more dangerous in machine learning. Yeah, um, I think that also reminds me of one of the questions that we had. So why don't we have a quick look at uh, at at least the most popular question for now? Uh, do you have a checklist before you put ML in production, especially when you replace heuristics in production workflow? I mean, the reason that it reminds me of that question is that you know, that's sort of that sequence of steps you're going through uh, in order to get like uh, uh, something you're happy with, right? Mm -hmm. Like that, that fully functional car. Um, what are your thoughts on that in terms of a checklist of things to do before putting machine learning in production? Yeah. Uh, so in terms of a, a specific checklist, I don't know if I have a specific checklist in mind, but what I, I do try... Jeremy Jordan had an article that you shared, I remember, that was sort of uh, right, right, right. machine learning project checklist. I'm going to try to find that uh, while you, you answer that yeah. question. Yeah. Jer Jeremy's put out some nice blog posts. Uh, that, that was one of, one of his blog posts that I've shared out. Um, I think if I was to think of anything in specific, uh, what I really try to do is follow um, an overall like, process for projects. And one of these processes that's, there's a number of them, things like CRISPDM, uh, yeah. TDSP. And, and um, you know, I'm, I'm a fan of looking at these models uh, and just trying to, to follow these models because there's been a lot of research done into the appropriate process for building out these, uh, you know, otherwise known as like intelligent applications, software mm -hmm. applications that depend on uh, machine learning models. Because I think that's one of the, the, the real big differences between just training a model um, and, and building a product, which is something I like to talk about often, which is the, the product is much more comprehensive than the model itself, right? The product is the thing that users interact with. The model is just one subcomponent of the, of the, uh, of the product. So in order to make sure that we're deploying the, the correct thing and, and responsibly, we need to be thinking about the outputs that the users are actually interacting with, not just yeah. the objects yeah. that, that we're used to working with, right? At the end of the day, value is being generated when there's a full product or a full service that's being offered. And we need to be thinking about um, how machine learning fits into the, the product vision. So I think frameworks like TDSP, which is out of uh, Microsoft Azure, uh, frameworks like CRISPDM and CRISPDMQ, which is sort of an extension of CRISPDM. You saw Crisp ML. <laughs> Crisp ML. I haven't. I don't know if I've heard about Crisp ML. Uh, but um, yeah, so well, it includes uh, things such as monitoring, which were which okay. were not in Crisp DM. Um, oh, thanks, yep. Raphael, for sharing the Booking.com use case. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. That's the paper. Yeah. So so all of these frameworks, I think, do a really nice job of uh, sort of capturing the different steps of the pipeline that you should follow when thinking about building solutions all the way from project ideation and product ideation to uh, building the thing to deploying and monitoring and operating the thing. And uh, I'll, I'll put in like a, a little bit of a plug for some friends of mine who have this really nice website. Uh, it's called datasciencepm.com. And uh, nice. it's all about project management for data science. And nice. here, the, the nice part about their website is that they go through actually um, each of these different frameworks and talk about the, the pros and cons of each. So uh, for the interested uh, listener or watcher, um, I would really recommend checking out datasciencepm.com, which is a uh, stands for data science project management. Yeah, I'm going to try to find that. Um, datasciencepm.com, got that wrong apparently. Uh, if anyone has the, maybe I just made a typo. If anyone uh, has the link and can share it, that'd be great. Uh, the other thing that comes to mind in terms of, I think it's great that you're mentioning um, tools or methodologies like TDSP. Uh, or crisp uh, the crisp crisp ML and then crisp DS no is that DS I always I'm I'm very wrong with yeah, that I'm not, I'm not, yeah 
I'm not, I'm not sure I quite remember, but it was like an extension of Crisp DM. It was like something, I remember saying Crisp DMQ, but maybe it's yeah, changed, yeah. I'm not and sure. And there's also Crisp MLQ, yeah. yeah. Um, well, anyways, there's uh, well, also in terms of uh, plugs, I think that, uh, that that's the right time to plug the machine learning canvas as well. Uh, so have a look at that, machinelearningcanvas.com. I'll, I'll, I'll share the link to that to sort of you know uh, help you approach machine learning projects in a structured way. But then, uh, so what I typically recommend is to start with that framework and then move on to something that goes into further detail like TDSP. Uh, another, another sort of uh, framework or um, methodology that, that I quite like is um, coming out of um, the people in AI research group at Google, so Google Pair. And um, they've got this guidebook. I'm going to try to find the link as well. Uh, they've got this guidebook on uh, how to think about the, um, the interface component, how to think about the UX component from the very beginning. And uh, I think that uh, the questions that they ask you to think about uh, are essential ones. And then some. I, th I think that what's great is that thinking about how people are going to use the product thinking about the design of the user experience sort of um, helps you figure out whether you actually want to build that thing, whether it's going to be useful or not, whether people will, will want to use it, whether it makes sense for them to use it. Uh, so I think that you know maybe this is uh, maybe this, is, this should come even before uh, the machine learning canvas uh, as, a, as, as I'm recommending it. Uh, but yeah, this is another great one that I wanted to share. Um, okay, let's let's say that we're we're, we're good for that question. Sure. And the market as done answering, and um, and there's another question that I think might might inspire inspire you, Luigi, uh, which is the second one because I remember that you shared this series of articles from uh, the RID blog about uh, project managers, um, and I think that they 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 talk about that you know how like what sort of technical knowledge they need to have. Um, about AI in order to manage these uh, projects successfully. Right. So these are these are uh, posts from O'Reilly on uh, product product management for AI. Um, again, I think that you know probably it's it's easily found by a Google search. Um, the so going back to my own list of questions that I had for you also, Luigi. Uh, there was another post. So I mentioned the post that you shared on LinkedIn about the, you know, not sleeping on how you define your target target variable. Mm -hmm. uh, the other one um, that I found quite intriguing. Uh, not entirely sure what exactly how you how you meant it, but you said that if you want more efficient data science, um, you know, one sort of recommendation would be to build loosely coupled systems that let machine learning engineers and data scientists. Uh, iterate independently uh, right. of one another, and yeah, I was curious to see like exactly how you do that, or if you've got any example of uh, doing that. Yeah, yeah, this one I think is a. I go back and forth on this one uh, because I spend a lot of my time. You know, I have a team of data scientists, and the sort of the more and more I spend time on, on certain products, the more I see that you know the in, you know the inputs of of parts of our software stack that we don't have direct control over affect the outputs of our model. Right? And this is a pretty challenging thing to deal with because as a you know as somebody who's running a technical project you'd like to have as much control as possible over the system that you're building. But if you're if you have a machine learning model and some of the inputs from that model are coming from you know different parts of systems or maybe some inputs are coming from batch ETL jobs that the data engineering team is responsible for other inputs are coming from forms on websites that front end engineering teams are responsible for and are being validated in different ways. And all of these things are going into your model. Well, you don't really have direct control over uh, these other parts of the system, right? So your, the front end engineering team may change up the types of validations they're running. All of a sudden, the types of data that's coming from these forms uh, will change sort of instantly. Uh, and you may, you may not be sure uh, what's causing those issues. So I think the point I was trying to make in that post is that to the extent possible, you want your uh, machine learning team who's developing models not to be constrained by uh, other engineering teams that are building other parts of the system, right? And 
although these parts of the, these, these systems have to interact with one another, um, you, you know, a lot, uh, we'd, we'd ideally like it to be the case that the machine learning team can continue iterating on their models without needing to worry about other parts of the system needing to be changed without having, you know, you want to be able to reduce the coordination costs essentially across different teams. Now, why I said I'd go back and forth on this is because sometimes I think that it's very possible to do. Uh, and then other times I think that you really want to uh, understand changes that are occurring across systems so that you can best plan for them within your own uh, machine learning model or machine learning project. For instance, we have a system right now that we're working on that is that really depends upon uh, a, a piece of software that's maintained by a different engineering team. Um, and earlier on, you know, I thought that we can really work and improve our system without needing to talk to the to, to the team behind the other system. But what I found is that there is so much interaction between the two systems that it's it's sort of not not almost possible um, or, or almost irresponsible. So that we really we really need a, a tighter coupling almost uh, in how the teams work together um, before we get to the ideal stage of. Uh, the two teams being more separated and being able to iterate on their individual projects sort of independently. So it, the ideal solution was that we, we don't need much overhead or much communication cost, but in order to get that, uh, to know, in order to get there, we might actually need to increase the amount of coordination and increase the amount of, of coupling uh, before that step. So, uh, you know, it's, it's a bit of, it's a bit of a trade-off and it's, it's, it's sort of a difficult uh, challenge that anybody in industry has to face, especially if you're, you know, working on working with engineering teams and, and building products that uh, things may not be as decoupled as, as you wish or would like them to be. But I mm -hmm. think it's something to strive towards. Right. Um, that makes sense. Uh, m maybe I have um, a, a slightly simpler question in terms of collaborating within the team uh, working on the same sort of machine learning powered project. How do you manage uh, remote collaboration? Any tips or any sort of lessons learned? I think that a lot of uh, companies out there are uh, figuring out how to work differently. Um, I know that most of my friends who are working uh, as uh, also consultants uh, in uh, as data science consultants uh, used to have to travel or to go like to the office and um, now it's sort of not possible anymore. It sort of felt like uh, for a, a relatively large portion of uh, companies doing machine learning, like, you know, this was one of the things that had to be done in person because there weren't that, that many um, methodologies to, to get that right, to get that remote uh, collaboration done right. Sure, yeah, I can, I can say a little bit of what we've developed and I think that it's working quite well. Um, first off, we do have a daily standup with all of our data scientists. Uh, and this is similar to a software standup where each, each day we just talk about what we did yesterday, what we're doing today, and if there's anything blocking, uh, anything blocking our work. Aside from that, I, I manage a team that's working on, on several different projects. And so we may have, uh, some data scientists that are working on project A and others that are working on project B. And what I like to do is have something like bi-weekly meetings, uh, mm -hmm. or weekly meetings within those pods themselves. Uh, so for example, uh, every every other week, uh, pod A meets and, and we talk about our progress on the project. And what that allows us to do is to share knowledge and to stay aware of what the individual data scientists are learning on that team. And the same thing goes on for, for pod B. Uh, but it's very important that uh, data scientists, especially the way my team is organized, where we're, we're in a functional unit that's serving many different areas of the business, we're not in an embedded model, we need to all remain aware of the of what we're learning across the business. So I also uh, have basically uh, bi quarterly meetings where we we mix the pods together and each pod talks about what they're learning from their individual projects. Okay. So the whole the whole point of this is everybody gets a chance to learn about what the other teams are working on without having to actively work on those projects. And the meetings are also um, infrequent enough where they don't become a burden, Yeah. right? So, nice. so, so every two weeks, you're, you're spending time with your team learning about what the other folks on the team have, have been doing. And then every month and a half, you're spending time with all of the teams learning about what each team has learned. And that gives us a chance to sort of pool the knowledge from each of the teams and to leverage them within individual projects. Another thing that I found to be quite helpful, and I'm a very big fan of this, is writing. Uh, and this means like writing 
um, even if you're uh, unsure of the results that you're achieving. And the way that we started doing this, uh, and I wrote about this in another short post on LinkedIn, is using these TDSP style documentation files, where uh, when you set out on an analysis, you create uh, some sort of document. We, we use markdown files that essentially captures uh, what your hypotheses were, what analyses you performed, and then what conclusions and results you were able to draw from your analysis. And these documentation files allow us to, first of all, they I, I think they endow data scientists with some sense of like accomplishment, even if we don't get the positive results that we want, because you have some output to be able yeah, to say, like, yeah, hey, yeah. I produced this thing. Uh, but more importantly, I'd say they facilitate a lot of knowledge sharing. We have these artifacts, you know, a lot of analyses are sort of one-offs that wind up never getting used, but at least once they're captured in this form, other folks who are joining a project can read all of the analyses that were complete and have some understanding of the work that was already completed. Um, and they also act to basically prepare us for these bi bi-quarterly uh, meetings I discussed, because before we actually have those meetings, I assign a quote unquote homework where everybody has to review these documents before going into the meeting so that there's some base knowledge of what the other team has been working on. And it's not all just an introductory conversation. Right, so what this allows us to do is is to prime everybody on the team with, uh, okay, what has that other team been working on? What questions would I have? Uh, what improvements might I make? And people are prepared with that before they actually get to the meetings. So it, in, in a sense, this all comes down to facilitating knowledge sharing as much as possible while reducing the coordination cost of doing this. Right, so I think asynchronous work like writing really helps to facilitate that. But and there's no, but there's no getting away from meetings. You need to have meetings. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but the the goal is to have as few meetings as possible and to make them as productive as possible. Nice. Um, I was so there's. Um, I think you should look for for anyone who's interested in uh, having sort of a template or an example of those markdown files. I think that what you need to look for on GitHub is uh, TDSP template, something like that. Something like that. Yeah. Um, going back to going back to one of the questions here that I think that I'm not sure how well we replied to that. How important is it that project managers know more about AI? So there's just something that came up uh, in my mind. I'm going to try to go over that very quickly because uh, of lack of time, obviously. But um, let me just show again my screen. So this is the machine learning canvas. Uh, again, pitching that. Um, but what I think is that at least, you know, the project manager would need to understand uh, everything this, that's discussed here. And sometimes uh, I hear that business folks or the more you know managerial people with that are less well versed in ML have trouble figuring out things such as, you know, how we want to evaluate uh, the machine learning model. And it's not so much a matter of, uh, you know, knowing about some of the metrics that you hear um, quite often, like AUC or F1 or whatever. I think that they, they sort of need to understand basic concepts such as, uh, you know, this idea of having your train data and your test data um, speaking in terms of, uh, you know, cost and gain values associated to correct and incorrect uh, predictions or decisions or so understanding, you know, um, some some basics, re real basics about um, machine learning is important, but also, you know, what it, what, what it means to uh, make real-time predictions versus batch predictions, um, understand that you need to update models uh, every few um, days, weeks, hours. Um, so I think that this is super important. The reason I'm highlighting these things is that uh, what we talked about in the beginning is creating uh, essentially, you know, making it useful, making machine learning useful for the business, creating value. And uh, at the same time as you're creating value, you're incurring costs. And I think that it's important for at least, you know, for project managers to understand about uh, these, uh, the, these sources of costs. So that could be in data collection, that could be also in accessing some external data sources, um, that could be in wrong predictions, wrong decisions. So that's uh, what I was saying about offline evaluation and the cost also of running the system. Uh, and yeah, um, so these were just a few a few thoughts that came to mind to sort of complement that the answer uh, to that question. I'm seeing that um, we just have one minute left. Is there anything that uh, you think that we didn't say, uh, Luigi, like, you know, like it's a key piece of information to have for someone who's doing machine learning or who's trying to put machine learning in production, like, you know, an error that you've seen 
again and again like what is the top mistake or the top pitfall and that you think okay i should just drop this and then maybe it will save someone's life <laughs> yeah um i would say if there's going to be you know there's so many things but uh, you definitely want to focus on um you know building trust with your stakeholders uh and and that can come in a, in a variety of different ways uh, but you know these your, the predictions from your models are going to be impacting end users in, in some way or another, and you want to you know put yourself in the shoes uh, of those people. So as a, as a technical person, it's very sort of uh, attractive to work on the technical problem uh, and to want to maybe after you've built some models move on to some other problem uh, so that you can start building the models for that other problem. Uh, but keep in mind that like depending on where you work and what you build. Uh, these predictions are, are really impacting people's lives in some way or another. So uh, you should have a, you know, you should feel some sort of ethical duty to uh, ensure that the systems are working um, as well as they could be and to, to really try to understand what's going on underneath the hood. Because um, at the end of the day, you know, the, the people who are using the systems aren't the, aren't the same as the people who are building them. Um, and they do want to have some sense of, of what's going on. So having a, you know, f focusing, focusing on the problem use case and on, on, on how these outputs are being used and, and, and what kind of impact they're having is a pretty pretty important thing to do. And it's not something that should just be glossed over. Totally. Um, I was just reviewing the, uh, I know that we're almost over time. So this is, uh, we are over time. This is going to get uh, published uh, on YouTube, uh, on Luigi's channel. And if you want to get notified, you can follow Luigi on social media, uh, but also, you know, just subscribe to his newsletter at mnnproduction.com. Um, what else? If you're interested in the machine learning canvas, it's machinelearningcanvas.com. Uh, what else? Um, and the replay is going to be accessible at the, the same address, uh, so crowdcast.io slash e slash mnnproduction uh, for 24 hours. And then, um, yeah, I think there was one last question that I think is quite cool uh, because I have no idea how to answer it. <laughs> Uh, which is that one on um, on the uh, different um, sort of components of a machine learning platform of the scale of Uber's uh, Michelangelo feature store, model monitoring, what's the next challenge to come? Uh, I don't really know what to say right now when I'm seeing this. Do you have any ideas, Rigi, to sort of you know conclude? What's the next challenge to come? Uh, yeah, I think there's a lot of work being done in... Um, sort of leveraging, you know, data sets are very important, right? Obviously for machine learning. And uh, if you think about the types of tools that are being built today, they're, you know, they're sort of, they don't say anything about machine learning. So you might use a data warehouse or a data lake, but it's just more of a storage, storage mechanism. Um, I think we should expect to see tools that are sort of tailored specifically to leveraging data sets for, for analytic, for ML use cases or, you know, uh, so, so things that sort of, help guide you in the development of machine learning models uh, that are more sort of storage layer type solutions. So I think, I think look out, look out for that. Uh, okay. But again, I'm trying to predict the future and we know how that usually goes. <laughs> so someone said, uh, sad that you stop your newsletter, Luigi. What, what's that about? Are you stopping? Yeah. Your newsletter? So I'm, 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 I'm pausing, I'm pausing writing the weekly column for, uh, for a little bit of time. Okay. But you still, you still post occasionally. Yes, absolutely. Okay, nice. Just yeah. double checking. That got me yeah, worried. Yeah. You know, <laughs> why am I talking about the newsletter? <laughs> okay, uh, yeah, good. No. good. So you, yeah. you, there is. Um, it makes sense for you guys to subscribe. Um, but yeah, again, that's not just the newsletter that I found super interesting. Uh, just you know, following you on on LinkedIn or on uh, Twitter. Uh, just look for Luigi Petruno. I'm not sure I shared your last name for anyone who's not already familiar with you. Uh, yeah, and on, on, on Twitter, yeah, on Twitter, just at ML in production. Okay, nice at ML in production. Cool. Thank you so much, Luigi, for uh, contributing all your your knowledge from you know, all those experiences of uh, putting machine learning in production. So nice to hear from you. So nice to learn from you. Um, and yeah, looking forward to reading more from you. Yeah, and thanks, Louis. You know, I've been waiting for a long time to do. Uh, some sort of live discussion where we have both Louis and Luigi. Yeah, uh, we're going to do that same, again, in, right? <laughs> in, the, in the same room. So I'm happy it, it finally happened. Yeah, excellent. Uh, thanks for everyone who tuned in. And uh, you guys take care. Stay in touch. All the best. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.